basically um, extensive processing extraction is how to get from modeling, which is a typical starting of, of a lesson. We all start with, uh, with some sort of modeling and through a structured approach, which is principled in two theories. One is called usage-based theory and the other one is called skill theory. I'll tell you very basically uh, what it is. So usage-based theory is the idea that when you learn a language, not in school in general, when, especially when you're a child, you are constantly exposed to the same sort of language in specific situations. So imagine being a child. You're a child in a home and you have your most morning routine, breakfast, uh, I don't know, your the, the, the bath, um, lunch, a play routine, uh, the, the story routine before you go to bed. And every single situation is like an attentional frame for the child to a specific number of chunks, which are more or less the same. So what this guy, Nick Ellis, who's the proponent of this theory says, is something fascinating, which is demonstrated, borne out by research now, by science. The fact that by being bombarded with the same sort of chunks, a phenomenon called priming happens, whereby you are basically primed by this exposure, a constant processing of these patterns to then at some stage produce them. This is called emergentism. And this is what happens in real life. We know with kids, we know when you are also abroad in the target language country. And of course, the other important theory which kicks in, if you want after that, is that then you're gonna start producing those chunks, right? And you're gonna become fluent through trial and error, through feedback, and through a lot of practice. So when you have these two theories combined, you have a powerful synergy, even in the classroom. Imagine you're constantly priming the students with the same patterns, with the same chunks, no single words, because single words, humans drop after 12 months in their lives. Yeah, when they're zero to 12, you start with one word. Then you start building what we call pivot schemata, two or more words. And usually you have one word that stays the same, and another one that changes when you are between 12 and 18 months. And normally these people's schemata start with, could be two nouns, could be a verb and a noun. But when you're a teacher, what you really need for the students to be primed to produce and later on to experiment with is verbs and noun or prepositional phrase. I'm going to the supermarket. I'm going to the cinema. I want water. I want chocolate. So the idea is that these principles, uh, which we can elicit from real life, real world acquisition, if we are smart, clever, and targeted, and deliberate, we can do it in the classroom too. And it's very simple, right? You want to have those people schemata, those verb plus noun, prepositional phrases, where then you can add anything else that you want afterwards, but the verb is the core of the sentence, right? So that's what you need and what comes after. So imagine you choose them carefully in a way which is absolutely number one, high surrender value. High surrender value means that this people schemata can be useful to learn also other language in the future. So if I learn, je vais au, uh, au gymnase, je, I go to the gym, I can use je vais also for the future, right? So it's high surrender value because I can use it in other circumstances. Also, normally highly frequent items are also high surrender value, of course, because you can use them in more context, the frequent, but not frequent coming from written language. They have to come from spoken corpora because you wanna get students who are fluent, who can communicate. So that's an aside. Now, with this in mind, usage-based theory, which is, getting primed through masses of exposure and skill theory when you basically by practice reach automaticity are the two if you want main tenets underpinning my approach 
Why automaticity? Because automaticity means that you move learning from here, the prefrontal cortex, to here, the motor cortex. Prefrontal cortex is where your working memory is, your consciousness. So it's kind of slow because it's a very small capacity. Information lasts only a few seconds. Interferences destroy sound or uh, can disrupt thinking. So you want to move in down there because when it's there, it lasts forever. With this in mind, let's go back to the beginning. So you first are going to model the language. I use sentence builders, but it could be anything else which shows uncompromisingly, without any ambiguity, in a structured way, what Professor Sweller, cognitive law theory father, called worked example. A worked example is important. You know that because at the end of the day, whatever you teach, you're going to try and present already made to whoever is learning, right? You, as a, as a tennis coach, you will show the server by doing it one way or another and slow and clear. You're not gonna ask, okay, I'm gonna throw, uh, I'm gonna serve now, use your inquiry skills to work out how I did it, you know? Yes, you can do that with adult motivated, adult learners maybe, but work this sample is idea. The students are imitating exactly as they, a, a child would imitate from the mother. Wouldn't the mother make it very easy and understandable and repetitive? Wouldn't the mother repeat it from different angles, in different kind of ways, in slow motion if they needs to? They would, because she's a nurturer. That's the role that my approach asks of you. As a nurturer, you're not going to prime students for speaking by simply doing listening comprehension um, activities on text read at the speed of light or near native speaker speed, right? You won't. So in my approach, the priming, which starts with the sentence builder, is an approach which is extremely student and brain friendly. You have your sentence builder, which is basically a variation on the classical substitution table. I didn't invent anything, but it has the English translation next to it to show also the differences between the two languages, yeah? So for instance, if you say in, in French or Spanish, I have 12 years, I will write, I have 12 years, because I don't want them to think that I am 12 years old is the same as j'ai 12 ans or tengo 12 años. So I think you understand what I mean. So small content, which you can always increase later on. You might pre-teach with flashcards, items in there so if you know that you're going to teach something i'm going to the cinema with my mom tomorrow there's a lot of stuff there so pre-teach first all the places in town through flashcards so that you lighten the cognitive load and make it easier now the first phase of my approach which is centered on a sequence called mars ears mars standing for modeling a for awareness raising and R for receptive processing. These three phases are basically one, modeling, okay? I call them MAR to make, to, to make sure that teachers remember that modeling the census builder, awareness, awareness raising is a bit of what I call pop-up grammar where you basically explain a few things on the census builder. Guys, this is the singular, this is the plural, these are feminine. On the census builders, you will have used different colors to highlight masculine and feminine using what we call input announcement. Why is input announcement important? Because when we listen or read any input, the brain will not pay attention to certain things. Because, of course, we have to rewire the English, Welsh, Scottish brain, don't we? When we teach languages, when we teach French. English people will not pay attention to masculine and feminine. English people might not pay attention to un versus une because they only have a, right? So we call this process of rewiring, creating a learned attention. So during this listening and reading phase, you're forging a new learned attention, which will allow the student to discover, no, notice things, that normally they wouldn't notice. That's the role of grammar in my approach. Now, 
So in this first phase, you bombard them, the students, with patterns which have been carefully selected according to this pr the principle I mentioned earlier, but also others. And you do it main may uh, mainly through listening. Why listening? Because that's the natural route of acquisition. Everything in learning languages is mediated by sound. So using a, a technique called scripted listening, where you use transcripts to model listening, a number of activities that I'm sure um, you can find in my book, Breaking the Sound Barrier, but I'm sure Charlie let you, uh, let you know about. These activities, listening activities, are not just random. They are sequenced based on cognitive law theory, number one. Two, they deliberately tackle each text through a framework, a theory called process-based approach. Whatever is a process-based approach, very simple. When you listen, you do a number of things, right? You process sounds, you process syllables, you process uh, the identi identifying boundaries between words. Otherwise, you cannot distinguish nouns, or verbs, lexical. So there's the lexical processing where you focus on the meaning of words. And then there is, of course, uh, the level of parsing when you focus on uh, the structure, when you focus on is it masculine or feminine? Is it future or, or, or is it a subject or, or not? And you also pay attention to function words, but adverbs, connectives, um, verb endings, anything that contains grammar which is useful for the brain to understand. So when you look at all these different levels of processing sound, but also processing the written word, then it, if you want to create a learned attention, you can't just say, okay, now give me the answer to the six questions about the text, because that task only focuses on meaning, right? So my approach is called extensive processing instruction for a duality reason. Number one, because you're extensively processing input and also output based on processes that science has identified. Two is called extensive processing instruction because you don't stop there. You're gonna, remember, you're gonna aim at automaticity. The curve is called the power uh, law of learning, which goes like this, it's just like the curve for COVID, yeah? It flattens, when it flattens, automatic, you're never gonna forget. Teachers don't do that. Teachers, if you've got that curve, they stop at the test. If the test results says that the kids have learned the perfect tense, they move on to the next, which is what I did for 10 years, 15 years myself, until I did my master's and the guy said, that's mastery, not automaticity. Automaticity is when you're not thinking. Mastery instead is when you know it. But mastery is vulnerable to Bjork's law of disuse. What is Bjork's law of this? It's something very simple that you will have already encountered in your teaching practice. Then now I'm learning the perfect tense avoir, right? Then somebody teaches in the perfect tense in être, and everything in avoir now becomes être. Then I've been, I teach the profession, the, the pronoun reflexive uh, verbs, and now everything in the perfect tense become je me suis allé au cinéma, right? This is because new learning interferes with all learning. So the, the idea of Extensive processing instruction means that those three things, perfect tense in être, avoir, and reflexive pronouns, if you really want to teach them all, then you need to interleave them together so that they don't compete for retrieval anymore because you're constantly teaching them. The kids are constantly practicing them. That gives them the chance to distinguish one from another rather than conflating them all in the most recent rule, right? So let's go back to processing. Loads of processing through listening and reading, a synergy. The activity must be fun and engaging, as gamified as possible. So for sound, I could do a faulty echo. Je m'appelle uh, uh, François. Je m'appelle Françoise. What's the faulty echo? Remember that the script is on the board so they can see François spelled as a masculine noun. Françoise. It's wrong, sir. Why? The first time you, the S was silent. Good. So this kind of games where there's constant interaction between you and the kids is interpersonal listening, which is closer to reality than bending your head down and noting down. 
remember that this listening should be as as far as as long as possible as far as as long as it's possible your output why because of something called the Mag the McGurk effect what the McGurk effect says I, I won't explain you what the McGurk effect is but what it says is proven by science they will listen with our eyes so the movement of the lips i'll tell you what the mccarg effect is anyway so imagine you're playing a tape okay imagine a tape behind me saying uh fla 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 okay you see my lips fla 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 the lips reflect exactly the sound in the back now imagine that instead of fla 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 i say fra 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 but there's still fla fla fa in the background right guess what you hear you hear fra 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 and this is a, an, an experiment that's been replicated a zillion times and i've done it with my own students i recommend you do it with your students too why is it important because it means that when we learn as children we pay attention to the lips i know because as a foreigner when i speak in england and i speak fast english people are constantly looking at my lips yeah because I'm foreign anyway, yeah? So the idea is that you model as much as you can at the beginning with the transcript, with all this fun game like spot the intruder, spot the missing word, oral sentence puzzle, but each with a rationale. I'm doing oral sentence puzzle when I say the words in random order, and then the kids have to put them in the correct order because I'm focusing on what we call earlier parsing skills, the grammar. If I'm doing faulty echo, I'm focusing on the sound. If I'm doing uh, an, an activity where, where I call listening slalom, oh, I'll give another one easier. Guess what comes next? J'ai une, imagine we're doing family. J'ai une, guys, on your mini whiteboards, what comes next? Uh, chat, chienne, araignée, uh, soeur, très bien, soeur. Ma soeur a 15, 15, 15 on the mini uh, sha, sha, oh, très bien, oh. So at that level, you're working at the level of vocabulary, but also grammar, because if you say stop before, when you say ma, there's grammar there. So the idea is that it's listening with a purpose. So you should ask yourself the question, what am I doing listening for? But all with a script or in a very secure, structured environment. Imagine the students processing the same text sentences over and over again from all these different angles through you being funny with gestures with images of course they're going to learn much more than from a stupid listening comprehension with 10 lines five questions about marie's daily routine where they're going to guess most of the time because they're going to use keywords because it's too fast so when you intersperse listening and reading and listening will gradually go from listening to a transcript to gradually the class, classical listening comprehension that you've always seen done and you did as students. At that point, after two lessons, that's a big innovation of, of my approach. You don't just do listening and all the full skills in one lesson, because to be honest with you, it's pretty silly, my opinion, unless you have really high level students. Why? Because PPP works with the elite. It's research, not me, we know. P presentation, uh, practice production is great with really switched on kids with other kids they will need much more exposure imagine say soeur, and asking the student to repeat uh, an average english welsh scottish irish students american students repeating soeur, immediately after you they're never going to get it right but after all this process waiting to talk until they're ready you'll find the phonics will still be important, don't get me wrong, I believe in phonics, but not the huge emphasis that we been given today. Phonics are very important, but they're essentially massive doses, only if you're not doing a lot of structured listening. If you're doing lots of structured listening, if I keep doing faulty echo every day, or, or spot the silent letter every day, are they not gonna get it anyway, that Francois is always Francois, that the S is always silent, that the T is always silent, that the when there's an E is not gonna be silent. Of course, you'll need to reinforce the, the phonological rule. Don't get me wrong, you'll have to, but you'll understand that 
we're using a method that's very similar to first language acquisition. After all this barrage of bombardment of chunks, you move to what I call structured production. You'll do that with a specific sequence between listening and reading and structured production by weaning them off, if you want, the sentence builder gradually, gradually, because you don't want them to keep depending on the sentence builder. And then you will embark in retrieval practice. One lesson, ideally two lessons, so frankly, but that's slow. Remember, we are creating durable learning. Roman, Rome wasn't made in a day. If you want to follow the pace of the book, then you'll, you'll perpetuate what's happening in England for the last 30, 40 years. If you want durable learning, so that when you get to your 10, they learned less, but they're learning well. And actually, they won't have learned less because a study by James Milton, from Wales actually, shows that if you teach them 2,500 words, they only learn 750. If you learn, if you teach this way, you teach 500 a year, you'll rest assured that you'll get at least 400. Even 500 as receptive knowledge as opposed to productive knowledge. Trust me, because I've done it with very difficult kids in quite challenging schools in Reading and Hull before. Now, what is the important part of structure production? That in structure production, you don't do like in the past, uh, you don't ask them questions like, what did you do last weekend? Because yes, true, anyone can answer, but then you'll find that the weaker kids or the less motivated kids will always answer that I played tennis last weekend or I played football. Whereas the kind of retrieval practice you would do in the structure production phase is quizzes, uh, games, retrieval game, for instance, oral ping pong, where you have students having a card each with the same English sentences, but on their card, each student has different sentences translated, and other board games and other things. And don't forget also traditional translation and dictations, anything which we call in this phase pushed output. Why? Because during structural production, what are you doing? You're ensuring that they say exactly what you want them to say many times over so that they don't just lapse into the same answer and gradually you go from extremely tight controlled act structured activities to these board games that i mentioned and then slowly towards fairly semi-structured communicative activities like for instance uh, you can do description of people, description of, of pictures. You can do um, um, surveys. You can do back to back when the child is describing a picture to the other one who can't see the picture. You could do things in common. One of my favorite activity is like a survey without a stalking part. In other words, you interview people to find who has the most things in common. For instance, you're doing animals, who likes, who has the most uh, animal they like in common. You're giving them a purpose, yeah? But the idea is you are using three principles. The principle of task uniqueness. Task uniqueness means I'm doing a task which is only going to elicit, for instance, adjectival agreement. Or you could have what I call task essentialness. In other words, uh, it's essential, but it's not the only thing. Yeah, so I may have agreement plus what I have, plus expressing possessions or when I did it. And number three, task usefulness. In other words, it's useful, but it's not essential and is not unique. That means, for instance, that if you want, you're going through from one to more than one and to finally three, four topics together. So you can see the cognitive load increasing, right? So it's moving from structured to semi-structured and finally you're paving the way for free practice, but not yet. Now, it would be handy to have here my matrix for planning, but the idea is that you go through modeling, awareness raising, receptive processing, structural production, and then of course, if you want, but only if you think that your kids will benefit from it, you'll now teach them the grammar. Why? Because you wanna make sure that the chunk doesn't say some parroting uh, stuff in the head, but you're able to for instance, with Romance languages rather than English, you have to because unfortunately verb endings change. But having said that, 
You could even teach verb endings as lexical items, as words. In fact, irregular verbs, according to research, are acquired as lexical items. In my approach, I never start with grammar during the first subunit. I usually, my units last one term. I have five subunits, four stop at what I call autonomy. Autonomy is really just a, a test, a 20% a, a of the overall grade. So imagine you've done your structure production, your, your grammar teaching. Remember, you can not expect a person to learn the grammar on the spot. You're only planting the seed. So you won't expect them to perform for you the perfect tense just because you taught it or agreement. Agreement takes five, six years to be acquired. So the idea is that they need to understand. You're working on understanding grammar, Ra gradually building up to when by the end of the unit, they will produce it. So at the beginning, you will stage, if you follow my approach, of course, you don't have to, this low stake tests every five or six lessons after the cycle is over and you'll begin a new cycle. So another subunit. So imagine unit one is describing uh, your cell physical features. The next subunit will be describing personality. The next subunit will be comparing and contrasting people's personality. The next one will be uh, describing their clothes. So you can see how the verb to be has been recycled all the time. Agreement can be recycled all the time. And when you get to clothes, yes, you're teaching porté to wear, but you're still recycling agreement. A black jacket, a great, yeah, and, 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 uh, the, uh, and uh, indefinite article and all the rest. These are four subunits in one unit. You can see the recycling going on steroids because it's constant. The last subunit, oh, the tests are very short. Snappy test because the year seven, year eight and nine, what scientific data do you really need? Do you honestly think that if you do all the papers and found in textbooks, you're gonna come out with some amazing uh, valid? No, it's bullshit most of the time, to be very honest with you. You can't have a level every two questions that you, that you answer correctly, it's just science fiction. So think about what do I need to know to advance learning? At this stage, what do I need to know so that I teach well? So that my students are served well, that I am not penalizing them. In my latest years of teaching, I espoused Dr. Professor Wilkins' whole curriculum idea. That is that after each cycle, I actually have a whole one or two lessons where I focus on the kind of mistakes that I've seen, things that need revising, or fluency activities, fun activities, games, where I recycle things for previous units, for instance, with what I just taught. So at the end of each subunit, you'll, uh, there could be review lessons, it could be anything that is not specifically to, to do with describing a people's appearance, but will include that too, so that you never lose track of it, yeah? And they're good if you've got time, of course. If you don't have time, you can't do that. After the four subunits, you'll have the fifth subunit, where you focus on fluency. Fluency is a specific technology developed, the fluency training developed by Professor Nation, Professor Segalovitz, Professor Wood and other people, which has been developed over the last 20, 30 years and plenty of research that works, specific activities which are aimed at only one thing, automatizing. You already have contributed to automatizing because you have recycled things all the time and you narrowed your curriculum so that you multiply the, the chances for you to recycle, because if you rush, you'll never be able to do that. And the idea is that this six, seven lesson at the end of a, of a macro unit are devoted to celebrity, celebrity, celebrating language learning, making sure the kids are fun with the language, they can prove to themselves and to you that they can actually do it. And most importantly, most importantly, lead to a sense of self-efficacy. I can do it because I now am giving, I'm, I'm given plenty of opportunities to work only on language I know. The, the trick about automaticity is not a trick, it's very simple, but when you're working towards fluency, you need to work with something you know already. You don't automatize something that you don't know. So you find that a lot of fluency activities that I see in books, 
imply, involve a lot of work on dictionaries, looking at things, asking the teacher, hey, how do you say this? No, this will be just, what have I taught these kids? It's 300 words, okay. So we have fun with these 300 words. If you have students that are still a bit iffy about 50 words, you remove those 50 words and you work only the 250 words because you want to be inclusive. And the idea of this is that when you get to the very, very, very end of the unit, the kids will have routinized, automatized all of these chunks. For a lot of them who are low ability, it'll really be a matter of Lego. They might make even grammar mistakes, but the idea is they're gonna put the chunks in the centers builds. I've seen it for 20 years, like Lego blocks. And you can hear, even hear the, the, the gap in between. Je m'appelle Marie, je suis Tania, je joue au foot, because that's the way this, autistic kids that I taught, um, disabled kids in certain cases, or simply kids who were not particularly uh, able, apt for language. It's not stupid because language aptitude has a lot to do with specific uh, um, uh, faculties, abilities. The idea is that once you've done your automaticity, you now give them a task. And this task is a real life task. I'm talking about something that lasts two minutes for your seven. For instance, you say, guys, now let's do uh, 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 an impromptu task. I normally don't tell them. I don't telegraph it because they're ready. Uh, and the idea is that the, the task would be kind of real life task. For instance, uh, I always in my workshop give the example of something I did the year I left, which was auctioning um, uh, three people, uh, supposedly family members, but you just get three kids from the class and say, right, you need to auction these three kids for a, uh, to, 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 to raise funds for uh, uh, refugees in Myanmar. So the, three ki the, the, kid, the kid is given a few minutes to, uh, to plan what he has to say, or if you're testing spontaneity, no minutes. Right, guys, you do a, a marketplace setup. Marketplace means that you have one kid placed, four kids, one kid placed, in each corner of the room. And the idea is that the other kids are, flow, are going around in clusters, each time stopping at one of the stations or one of the four people. And this kid needs to auction the kids, um, these three kids out. This will be the, what we call task one. Then you'll have another lesson in between where the kids are given feedback on their mistakes with an eye to improve them for the real task, but they don't know, you don't tell them there's gonna be a second task. The second task could be them doing the same thing but being recorded by a mate or anything similar. This is a technology called task-based learning or task-supported learning. The idea is that you don't test the first time around, you give them a chance to practice a feedback and then you test them and then you can actually assess them. That builds a sense of confidence, fairness, you know, because at the end of the day, they've never done that task before, right? So. It wouldn't be fair to test them on something they've never done before, right? They might have done something similar, but not in front of the class. So the idea is that the kids end the uh, year in with a sense of self-efficacy, they can do it. And most importantly, the final task would be only 20%. So along the way, they might already have a 60%, 80%. And by doing this repeated measure design testing, the kids are always on their toes because they know that every five or six lesson, Dr. Conti is gonna test me, right? And important, the first three tests will be receptive. Why? Because again, remember, they might not, a lot of them might not be ready to produce. Mistakes are caused by rushing to producing too soon. So if you do listening and reading, you're still doing something good, right? Fourth lesson, they can do uh, something I call 15 minutes or 10 minutes writing, where you give them a, a very, five, six bullet points, and they need to write as fast as they can. That's where you really know if the kids are fluent, or if you don't have that kind of class, you give them uh, as much time as you want, depending on what kids you're working on. But the idea is that when you get to the fluency training, there's gonna be four or five, five um, main conditions. Number one, the kids need to be given loads of um, chances of repetition. So the same, the task need to invoke a lot of repetition. Two, they need to be working against a time constraint, which ideally would decrease, just like you do with when you train sprinters. Three, there's gonna be trying to work towards the best possible 
uh, uh, scenario. Why? But, sorry, achieve uh, outcome. Why? Because by getting them to work on a task towards uh, working towards the best outcome, possible outcome, they're going to repeat it many times over, right? So, for instance, there's something called ten uh, best recording, where you ask the kids to read a text aloud as fast and fluently but correctly as possible. And you tell them they're going to record them three or four times, and the fourth time is going to be the one time uh, where they're going to hand it in. And you put them in pairs with another child or three. So they give them a lot of feedback to each other. Each time they listen to themselves, they listen to the others. So they, they're working towards, towards a high expectancy, ex expectation, sorry. Fourth principle, where very, very, very important, is the idea not just of repeating the same chunks, but repeating the same task many times over. So in this section uh, called fluency training, you'll, you'll try and, and, and stage tasks which are not identical, but involve the same kind of routines, yeah? And fifth and finally, very important principle, pre-task planning. The idea when you're working towards fluency, and so you're doing a fluency development task, you're giving them the, the chance to um, prepare, to plan, because that will, of course, decrease the cognitive load. They won't have to think online because they already prepared in their heads, already activated the language that they, the chunk they might need. So this talk about um, these five bullet points about your last holidays, the kids are thinking about their ch brainstorming chunks. Then they're, they're sharing the chunks with their, with their um, neighbors. Um, then you might stage an activity. For instance, if, you, if they have to describe some people, you might do some listening uh, with pictures of similar to the people who are going to describe for the speaking. This is called, again, priming, yeah? So anything which decreases cognitive load, because when the kids do any fluency training activity under time constraints, they have less time to think, and of course, they're more likely to make mistakes. So there's a, it's five hours in my workshop on fluency, so just, just giving you a, a, a few ideas. But the idea is really ensuring that you go from modeling to spontaneity in a brain-friendly way, capitalizing on the importance of listening and reading for learning, as opposed to listening and reading for testing, that you follow the typical progression of acquisition of anything, which is staggered, gradual, increasing cognitive load, deliberately targeting the micro skills of listening reading, speaking, and writing. Speaking, of course, as what? Conceptualizing first, then you're supposed to retrieve the vocabulary to express those concepts. Then you're supposed to make sure that you apply the grammar, that you put the words in the right order. Then you then encode the sentence that you wanna say in sounds, and then you pronounce those sounds. You can see how many skills there are in there. So the EPI teacher knows the micro skills of each skill and targets the skill deliberately like a PE coach would be with his physical education students. Not randomly, today I'm going to do speaking, today I'm going to do reading. No, there's always a question. Why am I doing this for? Why? And why at this point in the sequence? These are the three questions that should of course, who are my kids, but that's obvious. But these are the three questions for that. So this is the idea, guys. I hope it's uh, clear. I've never done it in 37 minutes. But yeah, that's the philosophy of my approach. Where can you start from? You can start from not the teacher language teacher toolkit. Language teacher toolkit is more of a generic book which with a lot of tips. But the research-based one where I took the lead on, breaking the sound barrier, is the book you should start for, especially for the priming thing. The other best source would be the one that I'm writing now with uh, with Steve Smith, which will be my legacy. It's gonna be basically about converting input into fluency. On my blog, there's quite a few blogs. The one about how I teach lexical grammar, those, this part one, two, those are the, the most, uh, but my thinking has evolved. You'll find a lot of the new things that I, come up with now because 
I have two colleagues who are my business partners in the language gym who teach a Garden International School and they experiment and I take their classes and experiment with the kids and we do some surveys and we uh, take quantitative data. For instance, uh, this year I was so glad um, the French department using this approach have actually trebled, trebled the French GCSE intake. And I tell you something scary. It was also the first year where they removed one option. So basically, instead of having two options, the prospective French students only had one blocked by a popular top uh, subject. And yet the, the French actually managed to, to do that. And interesting enough, the French department was the one that really adopted all the my books, things to the letter, and they uh, used the less is more approach more truly. Because one thing that, I, and I finish with this, the one thing that you really need to um, uh, remember is when you were your, when you were a student, and your teacher would teach you loads of things. If you were the language geek, you would go home and learn at home or practicing with people. But if you just capitalized, banked on what happened in the classroom, a lot of the things you would have forgotten. And this is very important because there's no point in teaching something when in year 10, after three years, you need to go back to it all over again. It's tedious for you, it's tedious for the kids. Make sure that you narrow it down so that it's really deeply embedded in their cognition that the kids can do it naturally. I always say to, to my team when I was talking to them, guys, how about every single thing that we teach from now to the end of year seven is learned as well as je joué au foot. If you achieve that, imagine we did that. It has to, it doesn't have to be je suis allé au cinéma, j'ai mangé une pizza. No, every single thing that we teach, which we think is important, has to be recalled at the speed of Jesuit, why do kids always say that in the exam? Not because they don't know the other things, but they know to automaticity only those three. So when they're stressed and they're, they go, they're recorded by for an exam, the, the quickest thing that comes to their heads is Jesuit or foot. And they say, and I'm sure that a lot of them bite their lips after. We say, why did I not say je lui un roman policier like I, taught, like I learned at home? Because unfortunately, when you are on, uh, when you're under stress, you unfortunately regress to anything which is default. You, the worst self you can be and the most repeated things that you heard and said and the easiest thing.